All the way this is the kids this morning. Can everybody out there hear me okay? The kids from Church should be dismissed. When Mark gave me this headset this morning, he said, that thing needs to be better than your jaw bar. I said, really? I got one of the brown faces. You even got a jaw bar. But uh, I hope everybody can hear me out there. I can certainly hear myself over here pretty, pretty well. Uh, very excited about being here this morning. Of course, always excited about preaching at Edgewood Church. Uh, excited about preaching behind the booth a little bit. Go ahead and throw that out there. Brandon, uh, I don't know if you were here last Sunday night, but Brandon preached last Sunday night. He sent me a message while I was at work. And he said, I just want to let you know I'll be preaching behind the new pulpit before you do. And I said, well, as much as you suck up to build that sound. Only fair, Queen Jack. Only fair that he needs to go first. Uh, speaking of Bill, though, I am very excited. My father talked to me to get baptized this morning. That's a, that's a big plus. How many of you know it's a new year? Amen. Amen. It's a new year. We're excited about it. How many of you have already wrote some bad checks and you don't pay on it? It's one of those habits. It's, it's hard to break, isn't it? New things right for you. They say it takes 21 days to make or break your habit. Well, if you write the same year on a check for a whole year, you surely do some stuff to break that. So uh, I'm excited about being in the new year. I don't really have a New Year's message to share this morning. Uh, in fact, I don't have a sermon this morning. I do have a word uh, that God has led in my heart. And in fact, I'm, I'm very excited about all that God is doing in the church. Uh, would you just look at the people you're sitting around just real quick? Let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. And just tell them, just say, you can't take the old you, you can't take the old you. into a new year. <laughs> Alright, look at somebody else and tell them, you can't take the old you. Into a new year. Alright, that's my New Year's message right there. Everybody right, got that knocked out. Uh, if you have your Bibles with me, I want you to go to the book of Ephesians. I want you to go to the book of Ephesians. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 6 this morning. I do love preaching the Word of God. Uh, anytime I preach, I don't even look at it like it's business as usual. Uh, I think any time the Holy Spirit is involved in something, it's not ever business as usual. In fact, the Holy Spirit can be very unpredictable. He can take you places that you never knew you would go to and put you in positions you never knew that you would be in, lead you and guide you in directions that you never thought you would go to. It's exciting being able to walk and be able to dwell into the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's so many different areas of my life now uh, you know, having a family and a full-time job and working at the church. There's so many areas in my life where I try to have structure in my life. You know, I want those walls there that, that show me those calendars and schedules and emails and, uh, you know, reminders and appointments. I want all those things in my life because I think it's good to have structure. But whenever it comes to walking in the Holy Spirit, I just want my hands to be off. I want to go completely hands off. And I want to allow the Holy Spirit to lead a guide in the race in whatever direction He has in store for us. So, as I, was, as I was preparing this week for this morning, God laid it on my heart to show this video that I want to show. And uh, I've shown this video a couple of times to the youth. I uh, showed this video back in, in late summer uh, when we had a boys camp. I uh, can't believe I showed this video. And, uh, man, I, I, don't, I don't know how many kids step forward that night and made the to the Lord. I know it was a bunch. Uh, this video is powerful, and I think going into a new year and making different transitions, you know, a lot of times when we pray, we pray for a revival spirit, don't we? We want to be revived. We want that good old-fashioned revival spirit. Well, if you study the word revived, it actually means to bring something back to life. It actually means to bring something back that was once in existence already. So a lot of times for us to come to a place of revival in our life, what we need to do rather than thinking we're moving forward is we need to go back. Wouldn't you like to just go back to that brand new born again feeling? That first time Christian feeling where all you needed was God and you were hungry for Him and you were passionate about Him and you hadn't let uh, or allowed religion to slow you down and get in the way and do all these different things. You were just on fire and wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. I hope you remember how it was when you were first born again. Some people grow from there, but some people stay in that same place. 
place their entire life. What we cannot do is we cannot allow our salvation to be a monument. It cannot be something that we just stand there and look at. It must be a launching pad. It's the beginning. It's the direction that, that, that we need to go in after that. That means the most and that matters to us as Christians. So I wanted to show this video this morning. And then today, it, it may seem very elementary to some people here, but today, I want to talk about the army of God. I want to talk about putting on the full armor of God and getting ourselves ready, getting ourselves prepped up to go into the year that we have ahead. Amen. So if y'all would, just sit back, enjoy this video. It's about 10 minutes. Alright, it's about 10 minutes long. And uh, I've always felt like if you can't preach something as good as somebody else, then just let them preach it instead of you. And this is a wonderful video. Y'all enjoy it. to introduce you to the gospel right now you are a rebel whether you want to acknowledge it or not I'll tell you straight up you are a rebel against the living God this is your natural disposition why because you are born in sin we are in a prison cell and it takes the awakening and the grace of God you call it the provenient grace of God to awaken us to the fact that we are lost and we can't get out we're headed towards destruction fast the enemy, because of our rebellion against God, has legal rights to harm and harass our life. There you are behind the prison cell. Help! I need out! You can't get out. Those prison bars are stronger than any adamant. There is no way you can cut them because they're stronger than diamond. It is impenetrable. You cannot escape. You're doomed because when the enemy comes in in the very end and he's going to finish you off because he has legal right to do it and he's going to relish every minute of it. In strolls your intercessor, your mighty man. And he stands between you and that accuser and he takes the hit that was rightfully yours. He takes the blow that was intended for you. That is an extraordinary reality that he was turned to a pulp and he actually died. God died for you. Over your prison cell, it is always said condemned, separated eternally from God, guilty. And then suddenly it switches. When you realize what Jesus Christ has done, it says justified. It says forgiven, redeemed. Here's the problem. Most of us have stopped with the good news right there. The blood of Jesus Christ has been shed and he was killed. And I want you to know that is unbelievable news. But we are still in a prison cell. And so we're praising God from within a prison cell going, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for changing the sign on the outside of the prison. And God's word says, <clears throat> could you check the door? to the prison cell because my blood was shed for more than just forgiveness. Forgiveness was the avenue through which he could make the escape for us. He isn't just interested in dealing with the consequences or the penalty of sin. He's also dealt with the problem of sin. Test the door. It's unlocked. The door to the prison cell is unlocked. Walk out. Smell the open air of freedom and liberty in the life of Jesus Christ. When you get outside the prison cell, there's like this chariot that's waiting. Emissaries from the king, and they say the king beckons you into his presence. You know how bizarre this is when you realize that you were a rebel? That you were undeserving completely? The living God has literally given up his life for you, and now he has set you free, and now... The very king is beckoning you into his presence. It's like, are you sure you have the right guy here? I'm a rebel. I, I stood against my God. I spat in his face. How, how could he want me? The king beckons you. You get in the chariot. And as you're pulling into the kingdom, you're looking for where they might drop you off. You're looking for that poor district. You're saying, where, where are you taking me? Well, into the very near presence of the king. He wants you to live right where he lives. Not just the penalty, not just the problem, but an invitation into his very near presence. But as you're coming in, 
The emissary is sick. He wants to adopt you as his child. Me? His child? We are brought in and invited near to share his heart. You come into his presence totally broken before the reality of what he has done for you. I don't deserve this. Why have you done this for me? I love you. I have a commission for you. For me? You want to have me work for you? I want you to work for me. I want you to represent me. Absolutely. Anything I can do for you, just tell me. I need you to go back to that prison cell that I took you out of. Because there's a whole bunch more that need to know about me and my love and my truth. Will you go for me? In a heartbeat. I would, I would gladly serve you any way you want, any way you ask. I need to forewarn you. I'm going to send you out. And you'll be as a sheep among wolves. They'll kill you. They'll destroy you. They'll hate you. They'll persecute you. They will do whatever they can to harm you. I'm in. I'll do it, God. I don't care. You shed your blood for me. I would gladly shed my blood for you. Take my body. Take my blood. Spend it any way you want. I belong to you in, in covenant. Take me, Lord Jesus. Send me. The commission, not just the penalty, not just the problem, not just the invitation to his very near presence, not just the adoption as a son and a daughter of the King of Kings, but we are commissioned to represent him. And I want you to realize that it's a privilege beyond all other privileges to bear the very name, the very image, the very reputation of God Almighty. And he says, I ask you to go. Go and make disciples of all men. Go and be unashamed of my gospel and preach it. Go, rescue the lost in the power of my name. For it's not the lamb that was slain worthy to receive the reward of his suffering. I'll go. And as you're beginning to head out with his blessing, he says, hold it. Wait, there's one more thing. Not just the penalty. Not just the problem. Not just the invitation to his very near presence. Not just the adoption as a son or a daughter of the king. And not just the commission. This is the capstone. If you think that is all good, you could wrap that all up into one ball and it still falls short of the final one. Because this final one is so condescending on the part of our king. It is so bewildering. It is so extraordinary. so amazing. And this is the truth that turns the world upside down. Before you go. What I'm sending you out to do is impossible. I know. Impossible. And if you do it in your own strength, you'll fail. I don't care. I'm willing to do whatever you ask of me. And if you want me to go in there and just die, I'm willing. I'm sending you out to be a victor. My children will not lose. Would you give me your body? And I will come in and make it my home. And I will take those hands of yours and make them my hands. I will take those feet of yours and make them my feet. I will take that mouth of yours and it will speak my words. I will take those eyes of yours and they can now see what I need you to be seen in this world. And I will take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh so that it will beat with my burdens and you will care for the very things that I care about. And your prayers will become my prayers. And your life and your attitude and your behavior every minute of every day will be the very behavior of God. Will you allow me to overtake your life? Because then we go into this world as little lambs with the faces of lions. Because the living God Almighty, the consuming, almighty, sovereign God dwells within his children. And as we stand and the wolf pack surrounds us, we stand in the authority in the name of Jesus and we will not back down. Because we do not head off to war to lose. We head off to war to win. Our God mocks all the powers of earth and hell through fluffy little lambs. Because his lambs beat the wolf pack. That's the gospel. The gospel trounces upon all the powers of earth and hell and demonstrates to the universe the manifold wisdom of God that he is in control. And even though we look weak, and even though physically and naturally we are weak, spiritually, greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. That is good news. And it is a lot better than what's being dealt out today in the church. We need to rise up Claim the gospel and say, I'm unashamed of it. Dear Lord Jesus, take what is rightfully yours. Don't just send us. Send us with yourself. Firmly planted within our souls. We cannot do your work. We cannot bring you glory. Even though we're willing to do it without you. Please, if you want to come with us, why in the world would we ever try? On our own. You don't have to go on your own. You don't have to pull off the impossible 
on your own. You don't have to fail any longer. Your God is ready to do it in and through you. You can't do it. You can't muster up the discipline. You can't muster up the intellect. You can't muster up the strength. You can't muster up the perseverance and the fortitude. He can. You can't love the lost. You can't love those that spit upon your face. He can. Don't pray that God would teach you how to love like he loves. Pray that he would fill you with himself and he would love in and through you. Don't pray that he would teach you to have joy. Pray that the living God full of joy would enter into you. Don't pray that he would teach you how to be peaceful. Ask for the God of peace, the Prince of Peace to infill you. Because if you try and imitate your own strength, you will be a miserable replica. But if you allow the impartation of Jesus Christ to overtake you, suddenly it all works. Because it's him imitating himself. And he's very good at being God. And take the helmet of salvation 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is an honor to be considered as one of your children. God, it's a privilege, Lord, to have your name on our lives. God, it's an honor this morning just to be able to represent you. Father, I pray that as we as Christians, as we as Christians move in to this upcoming year, Father, that you would just do great works in us and through us. God, wherever we go, be it in our homes or be it in our jobs or be it in the school place or wherever we're at, God, that we would represent you to the best of our ability, Father. God, that we would know and understand that you're walking side by side with us. God, that we would allow you this year, Father, just to take our lives and use it for whatever you see fit, God. Lord, that there would be a new level of commitment in our life. There would be a new level of surrendering in our life, God. Lord, that we would just put ourselves before you and allow you to use us however you need to. Father, I pray, Lord, that you just continue to do great things in this church. 2013 was an amazing year. A lot of great things were done, God. But Lord, I still believe, Father, that it's just the tip of the iceberg, Father. God, that there's so much more to come. Father, that what we did in 2013 was mere preparation for what you're going to do in 2014. And God, we're just excited about it, Lord. God, we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor. And I pray now, as we give you your word, that you'll speak through me today. Let your will be done in our lives. In your holy name we pray and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I keep thinking about a verse this morning. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start talking about it. I'm just where God goes for it. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8. It says, Therefore. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For he who suffers in the flesh is free from sin. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For he that suffers in the flesh is free from sin. I think for Christians, a lot of us in the world today, we've forgotten what it's like to suffer. We understand, we know what Christ went through, and we see the gift and we see the sacrifice that He gave for our lives, for us to be able to have this abundant life, and for us to be able to have joy and to have peace beyond comparison. He suffered, He went through great things so that we great afflictions, so that we can inherit this life more abundantly. And He calls us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, He says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh is free from sin. One of the things that I'm going to challenge myself to do in the upcoming year is I'm going to challenge myself to starve out my flesh. Because I really think that for a lot of us as Christians, we end up feeding our flesh more than we feed our spirit. And eventually our flesh turns out our spirit because it's growing faster than our spirit is. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, it actually says, walk according to the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So it gives you there very definitive, uh, very definitive signs that each one of us has, that there is a Spirit, and there is a flesh. And if we feed the flesh, it's going to grow. But guess what? If we feed the Spirit, it's going to grow as well. So the more that we walk according to the Spirit, the less we walk according to our flesh. And in order for us as Christians to die so that we may become more, we have to learn how to starve out, or as the Bible says, how to crucify our flesh so that we may be able to live anew for Christ. That we may put off the old man and the things concerning him and take on the new man, that all things can pass away. All things can become new. I believe mean, it's time for righteousness in the church. For righteousness in the homes, for righteousness in the families, it's time for us to get back to a place of right standing with God. If you go back and you study Matthew chapter 3, and you see the baptism of Jesus, Jesus comes out. John the Baptist is standing there. He's in the Jordan River. So amazing that our pastor is there. 
He's standing there in the Jordan River. And he sees Jesus and he points Jesus out in front of the crowd that day. He points him out and he says this. This is probably the most misquoted scripture in the entire Bible. He sees Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God was taken away, not the sins, but the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God was taken away, the sin of the world. It was as if he was saying, sin in its wholeness, sin in its fullness, sin in its entirety, sin in its completion. What Christ did for us on the cross completely banished sin. The power of sin, the dominion of sin, no longer lives in our lives because we have been set free by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. John had told people prior to this, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me, one whose sandals I'm not even worthy to lace up. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus walked out into the Jordan River that day. And John said, wait a minute, Jesus. Not me. I can't. I, I can't do this. I, I'm not even fitting to tie your shoe. And you want me to baptize you. And Jesus said this. This is so remarkable to me. Jesus said, permit it to be so now, so that all righteousness should be fulfilled. So that all righteousness should be fulfilled. What Jesus was saying is, in order for righteousness to be fulfilled, I must be in right standing with my Father. I must be cleansed. I must be as He has called me to be. I must be walking in righteousness. Permit it to be so now, so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. What if our mentality was like that in life? That what we care about, seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? Say it. His righteousness. We want to seek the kingdom and the king and the gifts and all that. But what about the righteousness? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus goes down, comes up out of the Jordan River. And for the first time in 30 years, your Bible records the Father acknowledging him as his son. This is my beloved. Son, in whom I am well pleased. I don't know what everybody's mentality is. I know in here we've got a lot of different sects of people. And we've got people that come from different places and areas and jobs. And, and there's a whole lot of different backgrounds going in here. But I'm sure this morning that if we really care about the Lord, we can all go into the agreement that our main concern as Christians should be to please our Father. That He would find joy in us. Have you ever asked the God the question, or have you ever asked our God the question, how do you feel when you think about me? What are your thoughts, God, when you think about Gary Mason? Do I move your heart? Do I make you happy? Do I please you? Are you content with me? Are you satisfied with me? God is calling us into a place of righteousness. And we must learn how to live there and move there and dwell there. And in order for us to be able to do that, we have to put on the whole armor of God. I'm going to go through these quick. The first thing is this. We have to stand therefore, having our loins and our waist girded about with truth. It's the belt of truth. What happens if you don't wear a belt? You're looking like a fool, you pass on the ground, right? Let me tell you something as Christians. If you go around without the absolute truth in your life, people will make you look like an idiot. People will make you look stupid if you're not walking in the truth. So many times Christians get discouraged because they try to do things without the truth moving in them first. We have to understand that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No way to go to the Father but by Him. We have to know that that's our gospel. That's our peace. That's where we stand. He is the truth. We live in a world that no absolute truth. That whatever truth you stumble on can be your truth and your truth alone. That's why the world we live in now tells us that addiction is the truth. That homosexuality is the truth. That all these different wicked things that this world has brought into perversion are truths. It's all our individual truth. The 
the world teaches us, do whatever makes you happy. Because that's your truth. But I came to tell you today, there is an absolute truth. There's still a cross that bleeds and a Savior that redeems. There's still a Father above that loves us, that cares about us, that wants us to walk in righteousness, that wants us to have the truth shut up in our bones like a fire, like Jeremiah said, wants it to, or and I said, wants it to live in us, wants it to dwell in us, to have that truth just buried within our life so that we can stand for the things that are right. The book of John says that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? If you're not free this morning, it's because you don't know the truth. If you're not free this morning, it's because you don't know the truth. Because once you know the truth about what Jesus did, why He did it, and how much it means, there is no condemnation. The next thing is this, it's the breastplate of righteousness. Who can tell me what the breastplate, I asked my youth this, they can listen to me teach on this before. Who can tell me what talking about? We're talking about church. Who can tell me what the breastplate protects? The chest. Thank you. Don't take it wrong. It does. I'm angry. It protects the chest. What's inside the chest? The heart. The breastplate of righteousness is there to protect and guard your heart. As Christians, we understand and know that the heart is the center of our emotions, is it not? Anytime we make a reference of love, we always talk about what? The heart. Corey, you wouldn't tell a woman that you love her with all your kidney. <laughs> you would tell her that you love her with all of your heart. It's the center of emotion. And that's what the breastplate of righteousness protects. It protects our heart. And our hearts have to be fixated on what Christ has done for us. The preparation of the gospel of peace, the preaching shoes, let's talk about that next. It's the shoes of being prepared. It's the shoes of the gospel of peace. It's the readiness to be willing to go. My son Malachi is three years old, but he understands what I mean when I say put your shoes on. When I say put your shoes on Malachi, you know what he thinks? Oh, we know somewhere. We're about to have something. If there was one message that I could give to my church, if I could just pick one of these out this morning and say for the upcoming year you need to do this, I would tell you this. Put your shoes on. Because we're going somewhere. Get yourself ready for the gospel of peace because we're about to go somewhere. Put your shoes on. And then above all, above all, I will tell you to take the shield of faith. If you were to ever watch any of the old war movies, the, the gladiator, the brave part, you see these guys with the shields, and you know that out of the entire army, the shield. It is, is normally referred to as a, as a defense mechanism, right? It's what we block off. It's what the scriptures are talking about. Blocking off the, the fiery darks of the evil. Get behind that shoe of faith. Let me tell you something, church. If you want to have a blessed home, health, if you want health in the home, get behind the shoe of faith. Now, I'm not even going to give in to finances. But if you want to have prosperity in your home, get behind the shield of faith. Parents, if you want to have godly children in your home, get behind that shield of faith. If you want to have a successful, joyful, pleasing, loving, kind marriage in your home, get behind the shield of faith. Throw that up and allow it to protect you from everything that the devil tries to throw at you. Because the devil loves, loves to attack the family. When God gets ready to give an example of what his relationship is with mankind in the Bible, what does he use? As a shadow, he uses what? Marriage. He uses marriage as an example. The bridegroom, Jesus coming back for his bride. When he gets ready to talk about the relationship between God and man, he uses Mary 
perish as an example. So is it really all that surprising that the devil tries to tear it apart? I don't know that's what it's going to for somebody. If you want to have success in your home, get behind the shield of faith. If you want to have joy, get behind the shield of faith. And I'll tell you what, when you get comfortable, when you get comfortable, that shield of faith, at first, it's real heavy for some people. I'm not just talking to the flesh right now. I'm talking to the spirit. When you get behind that shield of faith, for a lot of people, it's real heavy at first. It's awkward to deal with it. It's awkward to hold it. People don't know how to use it right. Sometimes you kind of feel like the shield of faith slows you down because it's so big and it's so heavy. But once you become comfortable with that shield, no longer will you use it just to block things, but you're using it to drive your enemies back. Amen. Shield of faith is a powerful thing. It's above all. To take the help of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The helmet of salvation protects what? The head. What's inside the head? The brain. We have to be renewed daily with our what? Our minds. For us as Christians, we must protect our minds. We must protect the way that we think. The way that we see things in life means so much. The Bible says it like this. As a man thinks in his heart, what? So is he. For us as Christians, it's so important that we keep that helmet of salvation in place and see it firmly on our heads. Because it's our salvation that reminds us that the devil has nothing against us any longer. When I talked about this earlier this year in a sermon that I did somewhere else, I, I used the helmet of salvation. It's kind of like, you know, nowadays we have a lot of grocery stores out there. They're called salvage grocery stores. And if you go to a salvage grocery store, you'll see some stuff in there that's got some dents and it's got some scratches on it, or a label might be torn or it might be outdated a little bit. You'll see these different things, but they're still selling. Why? Because they're saying that it's still good for use. For us as Christians, we've got some dents. We've got some scratches. We've got some people that, that are struggling with a lot of different things, but we are all still good for the use of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we cannot allow ourselves to forget that. The devil wants to point out your flaws. He wants to point out those things. He wants to point out those scratches. He wants to tell you that you're outdated, but you're still good for use. The Word of God says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in, who are in Christ. What does it mean to be condemned? If you go out to the city of Anniston, you would find old buildings where the holes in the floor have caved in and walls are collapsing and it's just not safe. So the city comes out and they hang a sign on the door that says it's condemned, which means this building is no longer fit for use. Nobody in the body of Christ will ever have a sign hung around their neck declaring that they're not fit for use. Because as long as we have a pulse, we have a purpose. As long as we have a breath left in our body, we can use that breath to declare the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Take that helmet of salvation. Never forget what God has done for you and how He changed your life and made you who you are today. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, so powerful. Having the Word of God in your life and knowing and understanding what it means means everything. It's the difference. Knowing the Word of God is the difference in being a good Christian and a great Christian. Knowing the Word of God is the difference in going from being able to, to be a conqueror to being able to be more than a conqueror. The Word of God is so limitless. There's so many things that we can do as Christians if we just understood and applied the principles that are here in this Word. If we want to be effective as Christians today, we have got to take the sword of the Spirit, this Holy Word, and learn how to apply it in all aspects of our life. I, I like using the Bible when worldly people don't know I'm using the Bible. I love doing that in my job. When they say, Gary, I need you to a simple team. We got a new project. A simple team. I say, all right, I need 12 people. <laughs> Give 12 folks. We'll make it happen, boss. I love using biblical principles. The world doesn't even know I'm doing it. The Bible changes us. 
You know, the Bible says that the mysteries have been made known to us. We have to understand this. We have to know it. But not only do we have to know it, we have to live it. It must become part of who we are. And then it goes on to say this. And this is where we are now. Matt, the musician, that can come along with Jason. Come and get a song ready. Once he goes through and he gives you every detail, every aspect of the body of God, or in the armor of Christ, it tells us praying always to supplication. That we should always be praying for one another. That we should pray without ceasing. You know, I, I struggled this morning to, to not do this, but I, I feel like with us going into a new year, what could be better than us as a church praying together? What would be better than us in the church just going around the altar this morning and pray for what God is doing in this upcoming year? Praying that we would be open to His will. Praying that we would be open to His plan. Praying that God would allow us to grow. I believe it's God's time for Edgewood Church. I really do. And I think it's time that we get ourselves ready and we get ourselves prepped and we put on this armor and we come together. And we allow God to take this church and do great and mighty things with it. So this morning, I'm going to ask everybody if you would just to stand to your feet. I ask this morning that we be a church that prays. A church that comes before the Lord with a willingness to grow. A church that comes before the Lord this morning in unity. That comes before the Lord this morning with a new passion and a fresh fire to see great things happen. The Bible teaches us that you can't put old wine into a new wineskin. Or you can't put new wine into an old wineskin. Because if you do, the old wine skin will burst. And the new wine will spill out. You know what, church? We can't keep doing things the same way and expect a different results. You can't do it in your church life, you can't do it in your home life, you can't do it in your work life. Got to change the ones. So this morning, I just invite you as a church to go with the altar and pray. That you would give before the Lord, and that we would ask God to take this church to new heights this year. That we would go further than we've ever been. That we would tear down walls.